Hello everyone. Thank you very much for coming. So we will start our public program lecture by Professor Emeritus History Department at Baruch College, Clarence Tyler. Blaming Black Power for the Confrontation over Community Control in Ocean Hill, Brownsville. And before his lecture, we will have introduction by Professor Gilda Juberman. Uh, she is co-curator of the current exhibition at Emily A. Wallace Gallery. The world, once again, the world created by Jews and Blacks in Brownsville. It was researched and written by Professor Gilda Juberman and also co-curated uh, with me. Um, and this project uh, took almost over a year and she actually um, did have research during the 80s uh, with the photographer Lynn Hughes. For the past one year, she roamed around the streets of Brownsville with the photographer Su Guan. Can you raise your hands, Su Guan? So she's here today. Um, so many of her photographs and also photographs by Lynn Hughes are presented at the um, uh, gallery. So, Professor Gilda Juberman is a professor of sociology at SUNY College at Old Westbury. She studies the social movements with a specialization in radicalization and political violence. Her research has been published in the journals Qualitative Sociology, Social, Social Justice, Feminist Review, and Mobilization, among many other achievements that we not go into every detail. So please welcome Professor Gilda Juberman. Um, for those of you who've seen the exhibit, uh, Once a Ghetto, uh, it was created to pay tribute to Brownsville, Brooklyn, to the resiliency of its people, to its history as a bastion of progressive working class politics, and is a place, as I say in the introduction, that is possessed, with a power to transform ordinary people into local heroes, unafraid to stand boldly on the front lines of battles about race, education, jobs, and housing. With that perspective in mind, there is no one in the academic world more qualified to serve as keynote speaker in conjunction with the exhibit once again. Clarence Taylor is Professor Emeritus of History at Bar Baruch College and the Graduate Center at CUNY. His areas of specialization include African-American thought, religion, civil rights, labor unionism, criminal justice, and most recently, black-Jewish relations. But beyond his scholarship is his biography. Dr. Taylor is all Brooklyn, raised up in a neighborhood that butts right up against Brownsville. Also, unique in the history of Brooklyn. Not for its progressiveness, I assure you, but as the butt of jokes from the days of Bordeville to punchlines in The Honeymooners and Goodfellows. Dr. Clarence Taylor is from Canarsie. When I did a fast Google search of notables from Canarsie, there were actors, mobsters, football players, rappers, and a sprinkling of CEOs, but not many intellectuals. <laughs> Professor Taylor is author of numerous books. I will mention just three of them, the ones that were critical to my research in writing the text for Once a Ghetto. The Black Churches of Brooklyn examined the role of religious institutions in providing support and building leadership in Brooklyn's Black Belt, from the founding of the AME and Baptist churches near the docks of the Navy Yards downtown and in Weeksville, through the transportable pulpit of Al Sharpton, a Brooklyn boy as well. 
Knocking at Our Own Door is the biography of the Reverend Milton Glamerson, who in the late 1950s joined forces with the Brooklyn chapters of the NAACP and the Congress for Racial Equality using both the pulpit and the basement of the Salem Presbyterian Church to spearhead the campaign to integrate public schools in New York City. And Reds at the Blackboard, a documentation of the progressive and left-wing origins of early efforts among public school teachers to unionize, and the role that American anti-communism played in conservatizing, aka professionalizing, the unions. Each of Dr. Taylor's works are meticulously researched, penned with an amazingly controlled style of prose, and always positions local, often Brooklyn-bred African-American as agents and authors of big battles in history. Which brings us to today's talk about the most spectac spectacular, some would say infamous, political battle that took place just 50 years ago today. After a 10-year-long failed campaign to desegregate the public schools in New York City, the black and Puerto Rican community in Brownsville, Brooklyn, demanded to wrest power from the powers that be, including the teachers union, and control the schools in their own district. So please join me in welcoming Professor Clarence from Canarsie as he challenges those who would blame that black power for the rancorous confrontations over community control in Brownsville. Thank you for that, uh, for that wonderful uh, introduction, and thank you for putting this together and inviting me here uh, to speak about uh, this important event that took place in 1968 in Brooklyn. So as you celebrate Brooklyn and you look at this exhibit, uh, just keep in mind that this event is much larger the borough itself. This event in 1968 is not just a national one, it was also an international sensation. 68 is an extremely important year. Lots of things are taking place in the 1960s. Uh, Milton Glamison, the Reverend Milton Glamison told me when I interviewed him, uh, he said, hey, the 60s, 1960s, that was a long decade. And of course, 1968 is key. And lots of things going on internationally, as well as nationally, the rise of, of course, uh, the Black Power Movement, uh, as well as the anti-war movement uh, at its height. Uh, so, this incident that took place in Ocean Hill, Brownsville, was part of that larger national and international um, um, uh, narrative. Now, before I begin to talk about the, the, the strike itself, I just want to also uh, give a shout out to uh, uh, Mr. Brian Merlis. There you go. Uh, my first book, The Black Church is in Brooklyn, which is my dissertation, Brian was pivotal in helping me uh, with that work because he has a monumental collection of Brooklyn and he invited me to his home to look at uh, the almanacs and, and other materials. So, uh, and he has published a number of books uh, on Brooklyn uh, photographs. Many of those photographs out here are um, um, it came from uh, from uh, Brian Merlis. So uh, thank you for your work, Brian. Thank you. Yeah. Now, uh, you know, turning to this uh, event in Brooklyn, for those who are not aware of it, let me just briefly uh, uh, talk about it. Uh, in 1967, 
the New York City Board of Education, along with the liberal Republican mayor, uh, that sounds crazy today, but the liberal Republican mayor, John Lindsay, uh, uh, also along with the Ford Foundation, uh, decided to endeavor an experiment to give parents more say in operating the schools in their community. Uh, after a long struggle to integrate the schools of New York City, Glamerson was a key leader in that struggle. That movement fell apart uh, because of huge resistance from the New York City Board of Education, the, uh, many, the uh, many white parents uh, in New York City, in particular Brooklyn and in Queens, and lack of support from important institutions like the United Federation of Teachers. So after that struggle, parents said, well, we cannot integrate the schools if, uh, if these forces are not going to integrate the schools and we are simply going to have to take charge of our children's education. Uh, for parents, they, they knew this was fighting to save their children's lives. The children were devastated by the school system and they knew that they were on the path to failure. So they said, we need to step in and take control. And so many community activists, uh, many civil rights leaders began to call for community control. And eventually, um, these forces in the mayor of New York, along with the Ford Foundation, um, uh, said, well, let's set up experimental districts to um, try out this community control, which was really not community control. It was more of a decentralization, giving parents uh, some leeway, some power. And three districts were established, uh, one in Harlem, one in Lower Manhattan, the third one in Ocean Hill, Brownsville, Brooklyn. And it's in that district we all hell broke loose. When the school board itself did manage uh, to hire a, what they called a unit administrator, uh, a superintendent, a uh, man by the name of Rody McCoy, uh, and they decided that we are going to define community control. And I'm not going to allow the New York City, City uh, Central Board to do it or anyone else. What we mean by community control is having control over the curriculum, having control over the budget, and of course having control over the personnel. This means hiring and firing of teachers. And in 1968, uh, in the spring of 1968, the, the school board voted to dismiss 13 teachers and five administrators from the district. And the letter from the president of the school board was clear. Well, they were to be sent to the report to the central board for reassignment because the school board really, the local school board really didn't have the power to fire teachers. But the most powerful non-uniform union in the city, the United Federation of Teachers, some 67,000 strong, uh, objected, and its president, led by Albert Shanker, made it clear, he said, those teachers are not placed back in the schools. He says, I'm going to essentially shut down the entire system uh, have one million children, you know, just close down the system. I try to make the argument it is a matter of due process. These teachers need due process as a fundamental right of unions. 
And of course, he was true to his word when the school district refused to allow the teachers back into the, into the school, into the districts, and Shaker then called a strike. Now, it was essentially three strikes that took place. Uh, and I'm not going to go into all the detail. I mean, if you were to bring it up during the uh, question and answer period, we can. Uh, one of the longest teacher strikes in American history, uh, a very contentious strike. And it is right from there that we get the dominant narrative. And this narrative has been essentially the narrative that people hear. It's been written by scholars. Um, <clears throat> you see it in documentaries on the New York City teachers' uh, strike in 1968. Uh, so that many writing on the conflict between teachers' unions and African Americans argue that such conflict was rooted in the politics of the 1960s. Writer Jonathan Kaufman turns to New York in the 1960s, arguing that conditions had changed for blacks and Jews. So, it's important to also understand this is a predominantly black and Latino community. The uh, teachers, the teachers' union membership was predominantly Jewish. And so, Kaufman argues that, quote, Jews weren't happy with the rising militancy and anti-white sentiment animating from the more militant parts of the civil rights movement. According to Kaufman, the rising black militancy was demanding power, real power. It was the rise of black militancy with such figures as Rhody McCoy, Sonny Carson, and Les Campbell of the Afro-American Teachers Association, and openly, according to Kaufman, an openly anti-Semitic organization was at the root of the problem in Ocean Hill, Brownsville. Historian Joshua Zeitz argues that New York City black activists missed the mark. Instead of addressing those who were responding for neighborhood segregation, who were responsible for neighborhood segregation, such as those in banking and in real estate, parent and community activists turned on teachers. As, quote, as grassroots activists began gathering momentum for community control, they grew increasingly casual in their use of such terms as, quote, educational genocide. I think that was one of the signs there that have come up. And intellectual colonialism, reflecting a growing consensus among movement leaders that their cause was at one with anti-colonial struggles in the third world. Such attacks on a predominantly Jewish teaching force were bound to result in exaggeration and conflict as it did. Now Richard Kallenberg, the author of a biography on Al Sharpton, excuse me, Al Schenker, <laughs> Al Schenker has been one of the most vocal advocates of the species that black power as manifested in the Ocean Hill Brownsville conflict was responsible for the destruction of what he calls the liberal consensus that brought us major gains in civil rights and labor. According to Kallenberg, liberalism stood for school integration and not racial segregation. It advocated the right to organize and hiring should be based on merit and not race. And he noted that one of the biggest advocates of this notion of liberalism was Al Schenker, who he referred to as one of the greatest civil rights leaders of the time. He attended the 1963 March on Washington, supported the Selma March, and backed a Civilian Complaint Review Board in New York City in 1966. Civil rights groups and labor unions 
forms a powerful coalition, national and in New York City. But it was the portrayal of this liberal consensus by black power that turned their backs on core liberal principles such as racial integration, merit-based hiring, labor unions, and the right to organize, and labor's right to due process. So as you can see, I'm just giving you examples of scholars who have made this argument that it is 1968, the rise of black power that has destroyed this, what uh, Calabria calls liberal consensus. Now the problem with this thesis that black power and Ocean Hill Brownsville were responsible for the decline in the alliance between a pro-civil rights labor union and black and Latino people is that it ignores an earlier history of the failure of a conflict between teachers and black and Latino parents. In particular, the New York City Teachers Guild and later the United Federation of Teachers. Now let me just a word, the New York uh, City Teachers Guild was formed in 1936 when it broke away from the communist dominated teachers union. And I argue in a book, uh, Red Chest the Blackboard, this break led to the context between which type of unionism was going to dominate in the city, clearly the nation. New York City Teachers Union, the communist run operated union, pushed the type of teacher unionism that was extremely broad. It took on the issues of the black and Latino communities, the communities in which teachers served. So it wasn't just improving the working conditions, it wasn't just fighting for better pay, higher wages, it was not just a matter of attempting to improve benefits. Instead, this union said we need to take on the issues that are ravaging the Holland community, the Red Star community, later the Brownsville community. The Teachers Guild was militant, but it had a more narrow vision of unionism. It was militant in fighting for the rights of teachers, but it had very little connection with the black and Latino communities that it served. And so I, I know uh, a few examples of this. You know, right at its beginning, the formation of the Teachers Guild in 1936, it was in a confrontation with the Harlem community over a principal by the name of Gustav Schoenchen, a principal of a uh, uh, elementary school, PS5, in Harlem. And on October 21st, 1936, 14-year-old Robert Sheldon escorted his cousin to her first grade class in the school. The historical record is not clear about the, of the uh, events that followed, but Sheldon claimed that he was beaten by Shoujin across the head and arms with a stick. The permanent committee of Harlem schools, made up of parents, activists, and members of the communist dominant teachers union, called for the removal of the principal. Two physicians examined the 14 year old and wrote in an affidavit that there were contusions on his left forearm about the wrist, and there were essentially. Uh, uh, fractures on his, on his elbow. Sheldon also had contusions on his left shoulder. Now, while the teachers union and the, the column community were calling for the dismissal of this principal, the new union, the guild, was critical of both the TU and the Harlem activists. They accused the TU of, quote, promoting a highly prejudiced 
handling of the case. I blame the so-called Committee for Better Schools in Harlem for circulating an a quote alleged statement of facts accusing the principal of brutality uh, and, uh, of beating this 14-year-old. This, uh, the committee, quote, caused an emotional outburst at prejudging of the principal and condescending language in what was clearly insulting to Harlem residents, the Guild claimed a crowd of, quote, overwrought persons at the trial helped to create an impression that Principal Shonshin was guilty. The Guild ridiculed the committee for passing out leaflets calling for mass action and asserting that Shonshin must go. One hand now, even labeled Shonshin a savage child beater. The Guild even questioned the severity of Shelton's injuries, noting that although photos showed him covered in bandages, the boy was in bed only during the normal sleeping hours. In an inflammatory statement, the Guild declared that demonstrations were conducted by white leaders with a following of Negro children from the school. The Guild used the tactic of Southern racists who blamed Jews and communists for manipulating ignorant blacks. Accusing the teachers' union of creating hostility between principals and teachers and promoting racial tension, Gill called on his members to, quote, guard against race riots and against class war. Gill's statement revealed an attitude toward black communities that was disturbing. It brushed off the grievances that black parents had of school officials. The fact that the guild was silent about the school's parent uh, demeanor, an indication of how far it was divorced from, uh, from that community. Instead, in its publication, the guild portrayed Holland residents as, as noted overwrought, too ignorant to understand the reason why their children were failing in school and easily manipulated by white leftists. And it also ignored earlier criticisms of this principle by parents. Uh, now, in 1941, I should know, responding to a newspaper reports on a wave of crime, a youth crime, the Guild issued a program combating juvenile delinquency, calling for reducing class size to 25, building new schools in ghetto areas, creating uh, of adult education classes, extending of child guidance and social services as an integral part of the schools, industrial training and in effort to address job insecurity. Now, these were fine, uh, demands by, by the Guild. But one point, of course, really irritated uh, Black and Latino parents, and this was put out by the, the Guild's Problem Areas Committee. And essentially, it did call for recreational facilities, but it also noted that the problem in Harlem and other black communities in New York was essentially pathological families. This whole idea to rehabilitate the black and Latino communities was pushed by the Guild. That the problem isn't really the integration, you know, that's really not the problem. The problem simply is that we have kids that are out of control in the classroom. And we need to address this. Gill even went as far as to argue that we should have more police officers in the school and that we should remove kids that are simply too troublesome to handle. Now, the Gill would stay firm on that theme even during the height of the civil rights movement in the nation and of course in uh, New York City. One of the things that uh, we ignore when studying the um, 
civil rights movement is the national reach of that movement. The civil rights movement was not just located in the South, but in other communities throughout the nation, including New York City. In fact, New York City had the fiercest, fiercest civil rights struggle. That struggle, of course, would lead to the largest demonstration civil rights demonstration of that period in 1964. The close to half a million children were kept out of the public schools. Of course, the New York City Board of Education come up with a timetable and a plan to integrate the schools. But early on, when civil rights organizations were uh, organizing to take on the Board of Education, <laughs> the Board of Education, of course, uh, made the claim, well, you know, are we really integrated? I mean, excuse me, segregated? We don't think so. And it actually issued a statement in support of the Brown decision in 1954, but civil rights activists then said, okay, that's fine. So what are you going to do here in the city? Eventually, the New York uh, Board of Education did commission a study on segregation in the New York City school system. So on December 23rd, 1954, the Board of Education created the Commission of Integration in response to civil rights activist and psychologist Kenneth Clark, who charged that the school system was racially segregated. The task was to recommend ways to promote integration. The commission was divided into five sub-commissions, including one examining the assignment of school personnel. On December 7, 1956, the Subcommission on Personnel Assignment issued a report with 16 recommendations. Many were non-controversial, providing subject schools with greater allotment of assistant principals and other supervisory personnel, relieving teachers of clerical and non-teaching duties, but uh, the Board of Education um, presently has the power to take action on this, but it was the eighth recommendation that sort of set up a firestorm. And it read essentially that the power to transfer teachers when they are needed in other schools should be done. This applies, for example, when teachers are, quote, excess. The, the board must accept the responsibility, responsibility of using this power within clearly stated principles. It may be diff, uh, difficult to get teachers acceptance at first, but it can and must be done. Improvement of teaching conditions in the difficult schools combined with a problem of informing teachers of these improvements and educating them to their responsibilities to teach and all kinds of situations are necessary to winning their support of this program. Uh, understand that uh, even according to the New York City Board of Education's own investigation, not only did they find that the schools were thoroughly segregated in the city, but in the black communities of Harlem, in Bedford Stuyvesant and Brownsville, children received less than a full day of instruction. In some cases, they were getting less than four hours. In addition, they had teachers who were teaching out of license. So you had music teachers assigned to teaching math classes. In addition, the schools were overcrowded. Classes were conducted in hallways. There was just a tre tremendous uh, uh, amount of uh, discrimination, you know, denial of resources going on. And this problem of school personnel, there was a key factor. Many of the 
teachers, the most experienced teachers, who are teaching in predominantly white schools because of the policy of seniority. And this item, number eight, really attacked that problem. So now they have a job to educate kids in these areas. And so they should be assigned involuntary transfers. The New York City Guild reacted strongly to this recommendation, making the argument, no, this is nothing more than a forced transfer. And its slogan was, we say yes to integration, no to forced transfer. Its president, Charles Coogan, justified the Guild's position on involuntary transfers by claiming that such a plan would lead to a transient teaching staff, lowering quality of education, and antagonizing the professional staff whose goodwill was essential for the imp implementing of integration. Coogan argued that difficult schools were not a racial problem. The children required more remedial guidance and services, not because of inadequate, uh, inadequate resources to black and Latino neighborhoods, but because of, quote, complex socioeconomic causes. In the Herald Tribune, Coogan argued that dysfunctional families were at the heart of children's failures. To a great extent, then, in other schools, the union president contended, quote, they come from homes broken by death of both or one of their parents, or by divorce. In many instances, poverty or other circumstances implies the mother of the family uh, to work so that she is away from home and not available to exercise any supervision over them. Frequently, language handicaps cultural differences and cultural deficiencies bring about a lack of interest in learning. And instead of, and, and indeed, a resistance for the school. Put simply, Coogan accused the children of not wanting to learn. Quote, these children are more frequently impelled to take out their insecurities and frustrations on society and on the school environment. He went as far as to infer that black and Latino children were out of control. Their behavior varying from child to child run the gamut, from annoyance to serious crime. In classrooms, black and Latino children refuse to stay in their seats using obscene uh, language, breaking rules and regulations. Criminal behavior includes assaults, robbery, extortion, destruction of property, starting fires, and other types of actions which bear some similarity to the blackboard jungle. I think that was in 1956, that film? starring Glenn Ford and Sidney Poitier. Civil rights and civic groups attacked the Guild's position. Edward Lewis, executive director of the Urban League of Greater New York, expressed, quote, shock. The Intergroup Committee on New York City's Public Schools, which represented 26 organizations, publicly denounced the Guild and the High School Teachers Association's opposition to the transfer plan. One member of the Commission on Integration said that the teachers lacked courage. In a letter to Charles Silver, president of the Board of Education, the Intergroup Committee urged the board to implement the teachers' transfer plan without delay. The Guild, which was part of the group, refused to sign the letter, uh, to sign the letter to Silver. The president of the National Urban League, speaking to 400 people, attending a conference of the United Neighborhood Houses claimed that the New York City teachers were involved in an organized campaign to avoid serving black and Latino children. And what New York Times reporter Mary Olson 
described as a bitterly worded keynote speech. Lester Granger of the Urban League said, one of the most disturbing symptoms that have recently appeared among teachers is their organized and sanctioned effort to avoid serving in predominantly black and Latino communities. Granger argued that it was more than a coincidence that these difficult schools are almost invariably those with heavy concentrations of mainland and territorial children of dark complexion. Paul Zuber, a civil rights lawyer who fought for school integration in New York, wrote to Rose Russell, who was uh, in the communist-led teachers union in late March, telling her he would warn Coogan and the leadership of the guild that if they did not change their position, he and ministers and leaders had agreed to take on the Teachers Guild before the Board of Estimate opposing a pay hike for teachers. So long before 1968, folks, we have confrontation between the Black and Latino communities and the New York City, uh, uh, New York City teachers. You know, so as I suggest, uh, the popular narrative that the community control movement and black power advocates were responsible for confrontation between teachers and the black and Latino communities is not grounded in reality. Thus, the tension between teachers and black and Latino goes back decades before the community control movement. In fact, that movement was in part a response to the failure of teachers to cultivate strong ties to black and Latino communities. Uh, so the failure of the UFT to win the support of parents during, during the financial crisis of 19, the 1970s, when 15,000 teachers and paraprofessionals were laid off and teachers were forced to accept salary reductions and longer school days was rooted in this long history of not building closer ties with black and Latino parents. So in 1968, the New York City Teachers Union did win the battle and stopped community control. And we got a watered down version called decentralization. But they, were, but they are losing the war, the public the fight for public education. The UFT's decision to help bail out the city by lending in $150 million from teachers' pensions funds in 1975, when the city almost went bankrupt, did not save the teachers from harsh austerity measures pushed by the city. Today we witness the support that many black and Latino parents have for the agenda of the educational reform movement, including charter schools, vouchers, testing, and ending tenure for teachers. The Robert Wood Foundation and the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health shows that black and Latino and Native Americans believe that public schools are not properly educating their children. 64% of the African American community survey uh, them that public schools do not properly serve their children. 45% of Latinos and 40% of Native Americans also felt that the public schools failed their children. The Brookings Institute reported that a number of polls showed that the majority of black parents support charter schools. The teachers' unions expect to gain greater support from communities they must not appear to be self-serving and forge better relationships with the families of the children they educate. And this is a battle I know from my book, Reds at the Blackboard, with the, the contest between the teachers' union for a much broader form of teacher unionism versus the sort of narrow one. Well, the TU lost. And it lost for many reasons, including the Cold War effort to destroy it. And what we got was 
a type of unionism that, as I say, was quite militant on behalf of teachers, but didn't cultivate those strong relationships with black and Latino parents. And if we are essentially going to advance and save public education, we need to do that. So let's take Brownsville, Brooklyn off the hook for a terrible relationship. Okay, thank you. So, uh, what questions? Yes. Uh, Project Head Start, which I think started out in 1964, was this really Can you speak a little louder? Yeah, I'd love to, but it's good. Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll tell you what's here. Well, I'm sorry? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll okay, tell you what's Yeah, Project Head Start, which I think kicked off in 1964, was integral, I think, in the Browns and all of the Browns and all of um, could you explain what role it played uh, during this time in 1960? Sure. Uh, the Head Start program which started uh, in 1964. Uh, this is part of the Lyndon Johnson's Great Society program. Uh, and this is because the program was to get kids in school before. Uh, kindergarten. Uh, so, the, the data showed that you know the earlier children started in school, the more successful they, they were going to be. Uh, the I mean, it really didn't have much of, of a connection to this later problem in the nineteen in the nineteen sixties. Uh, the, the program was clearly successful. Uh, there, there was some cutting back of uh, the program um, thanks to uh, you know the involvement in Vietnam, uh, but uh, the problem, the, the major problem in in, in, in '68, you know, had to do with clearly the disparity of resources for the, the black and Latino uh, children receiving in these and their communities. And the parents say they wanted to address this. I mean, the, the struggle for integration in large part was to assure that their children received uh, better sources. So it's all right to start off, uh, you know, get the kids a, a head start. But as Kim Clark showed in his work by the third grade, kids were feeling they were falling down. So, you know, um, it, 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 it was an important one, but it, it didn't stop that, that, that time. It didn't stop the failure uh, of children. Uh, and the evidence is clear that, you know, that they, many third graders were losing interest in education. Good no argument for me uh, uh, on that. Uh, but 
what I'm attempting, to, what I'm attempting to do here with others, like as you mentioned, Wendell Pritchett, uh, is you know make. I'm on your side. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, no, no, I understand what you're saying, but what we're trying to do, we're trying to counter this argument that is dominant. I mean, this, 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 I mean, this argument is pervasive in terms of pointing to black power as the culprit. And it's, you know, it's not just in Brownsville. I mean, we, we, we even look at studies in housing, right? Uh, there was a book recently, uh, Rochdale, Queens, where the argument was that, you know, this was an experiment to integrate, it was, you know, create an integrated community. And what destroyed it? You know, black power movement. Uh, there's a book written on uh, Newark in the 1970s, uh, right, and turning into, well, what took place there? Uh, once again, we see black power coming to the fore and essentially going after uh, well, white teachers. Uh, so, I mean, it, 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 this argument is like everywhere. Actually, I'm watching part of uh, Eyes on the Prize. And hearing some of the arguments, eyes on the prize too, where they cover the, the struggle for community control, and that argument comes up. Well, when you say black power, you know, we're we talking about the Black Panthers, or we're talking about the NAACP. It, it, it's not even. It, it's really well, black power. Right. It's, it's a too big a blanket term to use, really, is it? Uh, yes, and what people mean by black, with both folks like Kallenberg and Vince Canato in his book on. John Lindsay and others, what they, they, they mean by black power, uh, they are talking about uh, folks who are you know, either dashikis or black berets and black jackets who are sort of out of control making you know, demands uh, on um, the system, uh, simply trying to take it over, drive whites out of the teaching profession, or drive them out of the community, this is what they mean by that. And as you know, you are correct, black power is clearly much more complicated than that. You know, the, the Forrest Gump version of black power. You know, you've seen that silly movie, movie uh, you know, when the Black Panthers are, he's in the Black Panther headquarters and he fights this guy and they finally throw him out. Uh, you know, that, 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 that kind of silliness. In a lot of ways, this was a grassroots movement after many years of being felt as being underserved. And once it became nationalized, I think that attracted more national attention for the larger, quote unquote, black power groups. That's right, and the agenda was very, very diverse, right? So we had folks who were fighting for economic empowerment. Right? You, you, you had people who were involved in a cultural realm when it comes to black power. You know, uh, community control was one aspect of uh, 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 black power. So yeah, I mean, black power was a diverse movement. There was a lot of uh, characters, a lot of leaders involved in the movement. And infighting probably as well. I'm sorry? A lot of infighting within the movement. Well, yeah, I mean, of course, yes. I mean, that goes without saying, yes. But don't you think a tripwire was crossed? I think you, earlier in your lecture, you mentioned uh, the number of teachers were let go by the community. Yeah, but it's a school board. All right, now isn't that a tripwire? The UFT, when they see that, is going to jump right in and say, stop. I'm not going to, we're not going to allow this. That's when Al Shanker came to the forefront and basically went out on a strike. So yeah. don't you think that the power struggles between the UFT and <coughs> the community activists, really? But I, understand the union's support for due process. And that was the argument early on during the strike. And I think it changed that narrative quickly. And it, it, it moved from struggling for due process to we are being attacked by black militants. In addition, we are being attacked because not only because we are white, but also because we're Jewish. And it's Al Shanker who got a hold of an anonymous leaflet 
not, was clearly anti-Semitic, made half a million copies, passed them throughout the city. See, this is what I'm talking about. That's it. This originated from the school board. He had no evidence whatsoever for that. And so he sort of pushes his line, he sort of poisons the what? No discussion of what took place earlier. Because I think that's an important story that, that I laid out there, you know, uh, of how the Martin Tino's communities grew to resent what they saw as teacher's interest, because it didn't include them. 1967, before the 68 strike, there, there was a 1967 strike led by the UFT. And it wasn't just for higher wages. One of the demands which irritated, irritated black and Latino parents was this argument that we have to, something has to be done with unruly kids that need to be taken out of the schools and sent to you know, specialized schools, 600 schools. And, uh, and you know, so he made, it, made that issue about black and Latino children, which uh, once again demonstrated to um, the black and Latino parents that the union was not clearly not on their side. But I think another element was yeah. the uh, UFT saying that they would not be able to govern the schools. They don't have the expertise yes. to, to, you know. That's right. That, that's correct. I'm sorry? Question. Yes. Yes. Um, I'm sorry. Part of that. 
was activated again because it was that the world kind of really until you just embrace the culture. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't want people to get the point that the the union, the UFT in particular, won this battle. But in the end, it alienated itself. Um, and there's no, no accident. I don't know what it is. And you have many people uh, who have come out of support. Um, hopes, who would form a gender for black and female parents. A wonderful piece of art, uh, 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 a wonderful piece of art, you will see. Um, we have a scene in our area where you see it waiting for Superman. This is a document that came out a few years ago. Uh, okay, a judgment cabinet at the Hall of School. So, and he comes out, he was waiting for Superman to come save him and so forth. Because he has a uh, number of schools. There are loads of problems with And I am that schools that are really the And the union of myself really, a union of myself really a union to find myself in a difficult situation. You know, it's hard to get the politics. See, politicians using, using the argument that unions are self-serving, public sector unions look out for themselves, and the government like New Jersey, Chris Christie, who's got a cold union, the union leaders, well, thugs, <laughs> who are out there, essentially, <laughs> uh, undermining uh, citizens, essentially, by your paying high taxes, for minutes of a political art. And this type of document, unfortunately, worked well. Um, so, you know, education, we both started education, they want to be seen this year, you know, teachers rising up because of the visual condition and, and, you know, hopefully, uh, you can learn something. Need community support. So we think that it's for your community. It's not just a higher wage of the cost of your public education. Yes. Uh, I want to agree. Uh, I think that this effort in Brownsville, such a local effort, right? Such a local place, actually. Uh, play a role in establishing academic life studies and setting the precedent for integrating black studies into the Do you see that in the Well, I, I think it, it has an impact on community and leaders push for
Yes. Uh, I was just going to say that's the high percentage, about the ten percent. Having said that, if you speak to the role that the local black churches play, like A and E, Baptist, Brownsville, that's an excellent question. I'm sorry. Well, they gave that's right, uh, Reverend uh, Powers, uh, a, a white priest who was involved in, in Brownsville. He was involved in the community control struggle. Uh, the Reverend Milton Lavison, who I mentioned earlier, led a 10 year past to integrate the New York City schools, was responded after the movement fell apart. Well, he was involved in the community control. Struggle. Uh, even rising <laughs> to the position of vice president of the New York City Board of Education. Uh, but overall, I must say, black churches were absent from the battle. We didn't have to speculate to you why they just took some of the back away from, from, uh, from this uh, struggle. Uh, many had moved away from more activists, pastors, and ministers. And earlier on, you know, they came out and they got involved and in the civil rights struggle. Uh, and decided, yeah, you really not for us. I think a lot of them backed away. Reverend Martin C. Taylor of Concord Baptist Church, 10,000 members. Sandy Gray, Reverend Sandy Gray of Cornerstone Baptist Church, who had 5,000 members. And these are huge institutions. Um, and some of them gave lip service, some of them maybe kept the, used their facilities to house. Schools, but for the most part, they, they sort of stayed out of the uh, fray. So we mentioned Reverend Powers and uh, Reverend uh, Milton from last. But it is, Clarence, uh, also the case that for a moment at least, Brownsville became a crucible of black power beyond its own borders. So you had black power groups that had been organizing on street corners in Detroit and in Philadelphia since 1962 that arrived in Brazil. Uh, the Panthers were there, the RNA was there, Ram was there, and you know. It just turned off a lot of the black assets. What? It turned off a lot of the black assets. That's exactly what I was going to say because I remember Glamerson and the churches in Bed Stuy that had been pivotal. Right. were reluctantly or hesitantly supporting community control. Really, it was a gradual process because that report really forms in 66, right? And the presence of these militants, you know, it's interesting to think about to what degree they were silenced by the war itself uh, or not. And to what degree their rhetoric not necessarily the courts. It was not necessarily the right. school right. But it was there, it was on the streets, it was on the street corner. Yeah. Um, and I was the president of the the Brownsville, well, Brownsville what was the reference he heard all still around. I just saw him a few months ago. But yeah, for the most part, they sort of stayed away, and and, and non they state were theory of uh, black power actors. External ones. A lot of it was external. Yeah. From other communities that saw this That's right. outside, of their, outside of their control. That's right. Outside of their control. So I, you know, I just remember. Reverend Douglas tell Terrell telling me, yeah, I used to keep a baseball bat and go to the game around. <laughs> okay. None of them did show up.
Well, well yeah. I, the role of money in this. The role of money. I mean, obviously, the UFT has a budget. They control a shank and control the budget. Board of Education has a budget. They have a pot of money that they can utilize. The activists, on the other hand, really don't. Don't you think that money played a great role in this as well? Well, yeah, but as I said at the beginning, the Ford Foundation gets involved in this. I mean, it's, actually, it's giving money to set up these experimental districts. Um, so, again, money, I, I don't think, really is sort of a major issue. Uh, I, I think it's essentially how you interpret the, the struggle that's coming from. Um, and of course, the, these, these um, community school boards are receiving money from the Board of Education. Why was that more foundation? This flood, was this a result of the Detroit uprisings? Uh, well, yeah. Uh, not just Detroit, but you know, other towns. You know, it's just a center there, I would think maybe. Yes. It was close to home for them, and they said, well, let's just you know, get into this and try something. And plus you have to, I think that's his name, is um, <coughs> by the name of uh, Anthony Adam. And T, I can't remember his name, but he was on the Ford Foundation. He was a strong believer in uh, some form of the uh, community of So that's the Ford, you know, and once Ford Foundation says you're going to give money, that's John Lindsay, the mayor, said, okay. <laughs> it's not like things went smoothly in the Lower East Side. Yeah, yeah. They had, they had no, they had problems also done, but it's, it's nothing like this. Yeah. Oh, she had problems with this. It's weird. Like, so, 